Today we talk about honeybees, hornets, and poop. Welcome everybody. We are live, I believe. Let me know in the comment section if everybody's there. Hello, Sean. I can uh, Sean, I can see you. Good, good. Good to see you guys, everybody here. The system is working. Just give me one second so I can check everything here. All right. Today's live stream is, is a special to me because I'm trying to reach out these guys for so long. And they're very busy people trying to bring new information for all of us with hard work in the field of honeybee research. And it, it is a pleasure to me to have two giants of honeybee research with me today here. Let me bring them in so we can start this conversation. Oh, here we go. I have Dr. Heather Matila with me and Dr. Gard Otis here with me. Two giants. Uh, I assuming everybody at home already saw the video about. Uh, but we go over, we're gonna go over the paper again about how honeybees collect poop and use poop as a as a resource to defend themselves against hornet is the first description of honeybees collecting known plant material and the first uh, description of uh, honeybees using tools fascinating re uh, work and i'm very proud to have you guys here how are you guys doing great thanks for having us I've never been called a giant before. So oh, really now you're a giant, professor. Professor, I was I was reading your LinkedIn and your to to introduce to you, and I said, oh my God, that's gonna take the whole live stream. That's that's a lot. So I'm gonna call you the the black belt of honeybee research. Okay. Okay. That's that's better. That's better better than giant. <laughs> okay, I have the paper here with me. Let's see. Can you see it? Can you everybody see it? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Oh, wait a second. I see about the off there you are. All right. So let's give a little overview first. I, I would like you guys to introduce yourself a little bit better and tell me where you guys are right now. Because in a scientific world, people are moving a lot all the time. And I don't know if you guys are working the same place. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll start. I'm at the top of the list. My name is yes. Heather Paula. And I've been at Wellesley for 13 years now. I'm an associate professor there. And uh, let's see, I study honeybees for the last 25 years. I started with GARD when I was an undergrad student. And now I have a lab of my own and I teach undergrad students at Wellesley. Um, so mostly we study the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera, but definitely in the last few years, we've been bringing bumblebees into the lab. And it was, you know, super fun to start this research adventure in Vietnam, looking at Apis Brana and some really big hornets over there. So your research goals is social insects? You, are, you, work, behave, you work with behavior? Yeah, I've, I, I've always been super interested in animal behavior. Um, at Wellesley, I teach an animal behavior class, which is a lot of fun because I get to think beyond insects into the vertebrates and all the crazy things that animals are doing on this planet right now. But I also teach a specialist seminar on social insect biology. So I feel like um, I am very, very comfortable with honeybees, really love social insects. And in general, I'm pretty fascinated by animal behavior. Fantastic. Prof professor. You That's me now you're race. talking about. So I, yes. I'm Guard Otis. And I got my start with honeybees when my advisor, Chip Taylor, at the University of Kansas dragged me kicking and screaming into killer bee research. I didn't really want to study killer bees, but I really wanted to go to South America. So anyway, the fit eventually worked. And I came to the University of Guelph, which is in about an hour west of Toronto in 1982. And there I had a 36-year career working mostly with honeybees. Um, and I've been retired for three and a half years, but still actively doing stuff with bees and hornets and things like that. Um, so over my career, I got hired into at the university here to do applied research, but I also have strong basic research interests. So I worked on a honeybee breeding program. I've done a lot of stuff with uh, insect behavior, honeybee behavior, some stuff with butterflies and butterfly ecology. And I had a really successful 
uh, development project in Vietnam with beekeeping. And it was on that development project that I started to encounter these spots on the fronts of hives that nobody knew what they were or where they came from or, or why they were there. And I started asking simple questions and eventually then we got some funding. I teamed up with Heather again after she had already gone away and gotten her job, but she joined back up and we built this great team between us and a couple of students and a couple of Vietnamese researchers and um, yeah, yeah. Tell me about them. There are their names here. I want to give credit to everybody before we jump into this beautiful paper. Right. So Lien Nguyen, who you see there, is probably the only wasp expert in Southeast Asia. And wow. by the luck of the draw, she works in Hanoi, which was our base of operations. Hank, Hank Duc Pham, uh, was my PhD student funded through the development project that I had in Vietnam. So he's gone back and and had a, a subsequent career as the head of their bee research unit at the Animal Science Institute in Hanoi. And then Olivia uh, was a, a undergraduate student in my class who was studying fish for a master's degree, but she really liked bees more than fish. So she took a leave of absence and came over to Vietnam to work on our project. And Nop was a young Vietnamese woman who uh, was interested in biology and bees who we brought on as our translator. And she turned into a pretty darn good researcher herself. And now she's Dr. Nop Fan, who now has a postdoc appointment at the University of Arkansas. So yeah, we're a great team. We had a lot of fun. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure you guys have a lot of fun. Uh, you can see with the videos here. So I think my first question is how, how that start? How you start researching Poop, I, I, I would say. <laughs> how was the, the first observation? Who did it? How, how is that the whole thing started? You did it? That was me. So um, my, with my bee development project where we were working with villagers in a poor, rural, poor part of Vietnam, um, we had about 300 people who had gotten beehives and we were training them to produce honey. And a lot of our training and our follow-up activities would occur in the fall, usually in October. And it just happens, we didn't know it then, but that happens to be when these giant hornets are really active and visiting beehives a lot to, to, kill, to kill bees for prey. And so I would go in October and it was like the first year I went and we had beehives, it's like, what are those spots there? Like, and, and everybody we would talk to through the translated, the villagers would all say, oh, that's hornets. And I go, well, like, what do you mean it's hornets? Oh, the hornets came and then the bees, then those spots appeared. And I'm like, well, what kind of hornets? Well, we don't know anything about hornets. It's just hornets. And what are the spots? Oh, we don't really know. Some of them would say they don't know. Some would say it was something the bees collected. Somebody would say it was plant material. And then we had our best beekeeper in the project who actually was semi-commercial who said, oh, it was buffalo dung. And I'm like, buffalo dung? Because I had never heard of a bee collecting animal manure before. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he looked at me like I was stupid because this guy had about 25, or I mean, he had about 50 beehives by this time. He knew his honeybees. And he's like, I watched the bee collected on the side of the road. Like, hello, it's buffalo dung. And I'm like, wow. So we had everybody who was keeping bees reporting spotting on their hives. Most of them saying it was related to wasps. And we had one guy who said it was dung. And that was how we got funded. It was unbelievable they gave us funding. We had so little information. Wow. Wow. So right. you, you start everything, Professor. I thought there was a, something going on in a village and people talked about it. But no, you did the first observation and then you start to ask people around and everything comes to life. You know, I, I was lucky because I visited a lot of countries and worked in quite a few countries in Southeast Asia. Apis serrana, the eastern high bee. I've seen it in Malaysia. I've seen it in Indonesia. I've seen it in the Philippines. I've seen it in Thailand. And I had never seen the spotting before. So like when I started to see it, it's like something's funny here. Like, what is this? And it, really, this whole project boils down to asking some pretty simple questions, but questions that are based on having a really good understanding, both Heather and me, a really good understanding of honey bee biology. Wow. So for the people, if uh, let's imagine I have people here that uh, have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. So how, how in five minutes, give an overview about the discoveries. I, can, I have the figures here, whatever you need. Both of you, you guys can 
switch if somebody gets tired of talking? I'll let Heather do it. All right. <laughs> the leader author. Yeah, I mean, we really came back with a pile of videotapes and, and photographs and just a lot of field notes and a clear feeling in our minds of, about what was going on. But it really took a, it took years to kind of sift through all of that information and lay it out in a way that told the story we wanted to tell, which really does track the way that when we showed up, you know, we had these strong suspicions about what was going on based on beekeeper observations, but we really, that's a far cry from having data and, and really having the evidence to say that as scientists, biologists, bee behaviorists, that this is what we think is doing, that the bees are doing. So one of the first things we did was just, we had to confirm that spots appeared over time, like something as simple as that. So one of the first steps was to clean off the fronts of the hives instead of video cameras and just let the video cameras play on colonies that we expected to see spot show up on. And then go back at the end of the day, you know, we take those those cameras home at, to back to our hotel where we were kind of camped out at night and download them into our laptops and just let them play and look for spots to appear and then rewind just to see that in fact, in the moments before it appeared, it was a bee over top of it kind of working the surface of, of the of the high front. So that was just step one, was confirming that spots appeared over time and that bees were adding those spots. And so our next big step was to figure out what, that it was the dung that the single beekeeper suspected or you know told Guard that this is what he saw with his own eyes. So Guard and I, <laughs> well, everyone else was washing high fronts and doing some of the maintenance in our bee yards because the, the yards were huge. We had hundreds of colonies across three different acres. Guard and I walked around to local farms and I have pictures of Guard hanging out with cow dung, petting cows. Um, we were meeting chickens. I spent the day in a pigsty watching baby piglets sleep and waiting in the silence to hear if I could hear bees approaching to collect dung. Um, and we, we had several days of no luck visiting local farms, just trying to catch bees in the act. And then late a couple, you know, maybe a few days after we did that, um, I was in a chicken coop on the property and took some really dark videos of what I was pretty sure was bees collecting old chicken dung in this uh, chicken coop. And then we had the bright idea of bringing the dung next to the apiary because these bring bees the, don't- Bring the dung to the bees. <laughs> yeah, the, the Muhammad to the mountain or mountain to Muhammad, whichever way that uh, <laughs> phrase goes. And because these bees don't have a very large foraging radius. And so instead of us walking around, we brought it to them. And literally that afternoon we started, you know, within an hour we said we had bees foraging on the dung beside the apiary and we could mark them with paint while they were foraging and then see them on the surface of, you know, all spread out over the apiary, seeing bees that had marks on them that had just been to our dung piles now plastering that dung in little spots on the fronts of hives. So we spent some time I'm confirming. Let me interrupt here. I'm getting all excited again, just hearing about it because it's bringing up all these emotions of what we went through when these discoveries were being made. It was like, oh my God, it's working. It is it very amazing. exciting because like, like you said, we, it is never, there's no good evidence of bees carrying home anything from anywhere that isn't from a plant, you know, whether it's tree resin or nectar or propolis or sorry, pollen. We do know that bees will visit um, salty things like possibly urine or waste products to collect the salts, but not carrying home solids to do anything with. And, it, and in their mouth. They were yeah. carrying in their mouth pieces of it in their mouth which is also very unusual it, it, it is fascinating and when i heard you guys cleaning 300 hives poop of 300 hives i always kind of thinking myself holy oh, holy crap i think it <laughs> uh -huh. i know and we think the assistant means... did that we didn't have to do it the assistant did it I'll, I'll... oh okay I'll... oh yeah <laughs> professor you know, I see. don't make it sound like that guard we were the ones sitting in the pig styes and by the <laughs> at the same time while they were cleaning the poop off we were sitting with the farm animals waiting for them to come around i mean it was a dirty job no way no way you know paint it but 
I think what was really so surprising, we all think of bees as being very, very clean. You know, they are, they have clean homes, they have food that's in their homes, they're raising babies there, they really need to keep this environment uh, microbially like controlled. And so the fact that they're crawling around and when they are collecting this dung, you, you probably have a video of it. They're not just, you know, gingerly yeah, grabbing right. it, they're on the dung, pulling at it with their mouth parts and their feet yeah. or their, their front legs, like really Look trying to, yeah, that's a, that's chicken dung right there. Wow. You become a specialist in poop too. Yeah. Yeah. We can tell them apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So once we had some videos of this and I spent a lot of time taking videos like this because I really felt like no one's going to believe this unless we have very good evidence yeah. that we can include in a paper that shows that it truly is, and you can see all the other little invertebrates crawling around in this dung. And it's a filthy environment filled with things that normal, there's the big dung pile. Um, so we had, just after that, we were like, okay, let's, let's get going here. We know the bees are collecting dung. We know that they're adding it to the front. We need some data. So we started doing some tracking where we would allow colonies to get attacked by hornets, mm -hmm. two different kinds of hornets, the first one being uh, the giant hornet in, in Vietnam, which is Vespa sore, but also Vespa velatina, which is a, a predator of honeybees, but not the same level of threat in Vietnam. In Vietnam, they hover in front of the colonies and they don't land on them. They don't try and break in in groups to take over the colony. Um, so we started letting hornets attack the colonies and seeing how the bees responded with their spotting behavior and how long that spotting lasted over time. And it turns out that once giant hornets show up, you do get a spotting response and it's pretty sustained over days. So and it's, um, quick. it's quick. Yeah. The bees start pretty fast. They get upset. We have another paper that we might talk about in the future that shows that they communicate a lot in these moments when the giant hornets are outside and the bees rally quickly and you start to see these spots being added you know within really within minutes by mm -hmm. in some of the colonies really then, is that fast yeah. yeah and then and then the spotting can go on for days thereafter even in the absence of hornets we waved hornets away from some colonies and we could see the colonies still adding spots over time and, and so. is a is a dense communication is a f hormone communication is a mix to, oh. it's, it's probably all of the above. I mean, it, bees are really multimodal communicators, meaning that yeah. they like to communicate across a variety of different modalities. And you know, the, our subsequent work in a lot of these hives, we popped microphones into the colonies, and they're making a lot of noises in there that we call vibroacoustic signals. These are sounds that we hear with our ears, but the bees feel as vibrations. So you know, we can record them as researchers and and um, and know what the sounds are that, that they're making, but they're sharing them in a different way. Um, there's probably a lot of uh, alarm pheromone or chemical communication happening at the same time. We, you know, our, our sense is, this is something we're still collecting data on. We have another field season planned. We, we get a sense from our data that the visuals of the hornets are very important. So it's kind of a combination of all of these things at once um, that are is likely causing this reaction and although we, we, we we're working on putting that out we showed in our study that this one that you're taught presenting here that the uh the marking pheromone of the hornet would also elicit almost a full in a, a lower response but a full suite of the behaviors of the spotting behavior that we're that the paper was about yeah. so the, 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 response. The, the hornet pheromone and then they react to that too Yes. So it's like they're reacting in all sorts of ways. It's, it's if, really complex. If they see a real hornet, that's the strongest reaction. A real hornet is really across the different ways that we're looking at this. That's what elicits the strongest reaction. So we have this information that says these, the bees are responding to a certain category of hornet, especially strongly with this response, the spotting behavior. And you can see that hive entrance right there. We labeled all the hives with numbers depending on the apiary and the colony number and the side of the hive that the entrance was on. And you can see the numbers getting covered over by these little dots of poop. So this is what we will call a heavily spotted entrance where it really is becoming like a plastered coat of all these little spots, especially around the entrance. Yeah, it's a lot. 
So then the next question is, why are they doing it? <laughs> you know, yeah. what what does this get for for the bees for all their trouble? And um, one thing that we could do is videotape a lot of these hornet attacks because, like Gard said, this was the time of year when we were there that there was a lot of um, a lot of hornet attacks happening on the colonies. And these attacks could involve. Here's one with two hornets present. I, if I'm remembering this video, there could be a third hornet that comes in, and you can see them kind of. This is a heavily spotted colony. They're really not going near the entrance, and and they're kind of dancing around the top of the hive where, there, where there's fewer spots. If they land near the entrance, they uh, see see them landing very briefly and picking their picking themselves back up again. There's a third hornet coming in. Um, but if this colony was not heavily spotted, what you often get are the hornets really lingering at the entrance, looking inside, starting to chew on the entrance, um, because ultimately what they want to do is break their way in. And so we have good evidence at this point from our videos. Here's a hornet um, marking an unspotted nest with her uh, gastral sternite glands, or, which really... Um, you know, this is something we're also trying to figure out. The thought is that at least one of the glands on their abdomen or their gaster is responsible for leaving a chemical trail that really draws in other hornets for a, an attack. And you can see her wagging her abdomen back and forth, dragging it on the surface there. Um, yeah, so one, we have some pretty good evidence at this point that colonies that have this heavy level of spotting are somewhat emancipated from the time that the the hornets spend concentrated on the entrance in groups. They don't like to land there as long and they're far less likely to chew on, on the entrance as well. And since their goal is to break into the colony and force all the workers, either kill them outright or force them to leave and stop defending their home, then the hornets will move in and uh, defend the colony as though it was, were their own and take their time bringing the bee larvae, the pupae back to their own nest where they'll feed it to their hungry larvae as prey, as fresh meat basically because they're predators. So, um, you know, their focus when they're doing a group attack is to take over the colony without any adult defending bees left and um, take that that booty as their, you know, treasure for all of their work. And it, but if they can't get in the front door, they can't do this. I, I don't know much about hornet biology. How many of them it takes to take a whole honey beehive? Mm, do you know? Uh, so there's been a lot of study in Japan of the other giant hornet, Vespa mandarinia. We got lucky in a sense in that the species that was in Vietnam, we didn't realize it when we started out, it's actually a very poorly known and described species. So almost everything we were learning about it was new for that species. But um, we, in, in, we would see, it, it depends on the hive and we rarely let them actually take over a hive. We only allowed one hive, one colony to be uh, destroyed by the hornets. Um, because we were working with beekeepers and they didn't want their bees destroyed, right? Um, and we had in that case, it wasn't a huge number, but it's hard to know the number because you've got the number that are on the beehive at one point in time, but then you've got the ones that are going back and forth and are back in their own nest. So you don't really know how, without marking them, you can't tell how many are involved. Yeah, that I one of them, we had at least 20 hornets involved in a yeah. pack on a hive. And I would guess 20, 30, 35, maybe. And um, the bees successfully killed several of those hornets in that single yeah. attack that we allowed to progress. Um, but uh, at any one time in the videos, I don't think we saw more than eight hornets at a single time. But some of the reports for Vespa mandarinia um, by Japanese researchers say that the attacks can include up to 50 hornets. But the same apiary where we allowed the attack to go, we had hornets that arrived one day and it was kind of funny we we had everything set up with the microphones in the hive and everything at hive number four and the and the hornet showed up at hive number one and i'm like what do we do what do we do what do we do how do we get the, the hornets to go down the line so i'm sitting there with my butterfly neck closed so it's like a round plate and i'm pushing the hornets out of the way hoping that i'm not disturbing them so much they're going to attack me right 
And I pushed a good, I put, there were at least 20 Hornets that were present that I moved out of the way before they left number one and went to number four. So we achieved the purpose and <laughs> got what we good. wanted. You have a new job description. Yeah, I know. Hornet pusher. I, think, I would add that when we got into this at the beginning, we were getting ready to go to Vietnam. And I have a friend who went to the same grad school I went to at the University of Kansas who studies social hornets, social wasps. And I, his name is John Wenzel. And I, I wrote to John. I said, John, we're going to Vietnam to study these giant hornets. What do you recommend we do to stay safe? And he writes back. He says, well, in Japan, they use hazmat suits. But if you wear a hazmat suit in Vietnam, you're going to cook to death. So I can't help you. And that's we ended up going to Vietnam. Like, how the heck are we going to prevent getting stung to death by these hornets? And in the end, it turned out if they're not at their own nest, if they're out away and foraging, and they haven't actually taken over a hive that they're defending, they're kind of like non-entities. They don't put up any defense whatsoever. So we could push them away with our hands, actually, toward the end. We just move through the air and push a hornet, just like you would do with any bees. If you don't want them in your face, you just push them aside. We do the same thing with these hornets that are like three times the size of a honeybee. That, yeah, I became, you know. I became pretty obsessed with taking as many videos as I could, just trying to get evidence for future papers. And I would be, you know, right up in the a foot away from the entrance and the hornets were so focused on the bees and the bee entrance that I never felt threatened at all in any way by the bees or the hornets. That's good to know. That's good to know. Just don't go to one of their nests and uh, accidentally yeah. step on it because that's a different story. Yeah, I, I bet it is. <laughs> so, and how, so how you prove, how you demonstrate the thing is the thing is is a defensive behavior how, how you demonstrate that that the spotting is a defensive behavior yeah well you what we did specifically was we had scenarios where we had colonies that we allowed to get attacked and we had colonies that were left as controls or unattacked um in some instances there was the doctor guard there with the not letting the, the, the hornets to go to the control hives? Yeah, well, when you're in a yard with hundreds of bee colonies, you know, yeah. our biggest yard had 130, I think, colonies. Mm -hmm. And we have people stationed all throughout. And the hornets are really loud. You can hear them coming in, um, like a little whirring buzz. So it's mm -hmm. they can't really sneak up on you. If, you're, if it's quiet and you're paying attention, you know where they're coming from as they're entering the apiary. So we had people stationed throughout. And we would identify colonies that were, you know, really quiet in the sense right away, first thing in the morning, no indication that they had been attacked. And then once the attacks started happening, we'd say, okay, this, these colonies over here, we're going to let the, those attacks proceed. And these colonies we can tell have not been attacked. We've been here all morning. We haven't seen any hornets at them. If anybody shows up, we're going to wave them away before they even get near it. Um, like Art said, it's pretty easy to to wave the hornets away. Um, you know, in addition to butterfly nets, we just had long sticks with plastic bags at the end. And that was yeah, enough to yeah, yeah. them move in another direction if they were coming at you. So um, we could keep colony fronts and the hive fronts and the bees, their perception of life that morning was hornet free. And between those two groups, we could see that the bees that were the colonies that where the hornets were visiting were the ones that were initiating those spotting responses and the ones that were hornet free were really not doing that behavior. Wow. The big, the big uh, trick came in trying to actually demonstrate that the spotting was deterring the hornets. And we did that by um, setting up video cameras and when a hornet would come in, we had, we, we had already allowed spotting to occur in the apiary. So as you, we had spotting levels that were, non-existent, no spots on the fronts of the hives, to hives like you showed before that like this, heavily plastered with dung. And uh, then the hornets would come in and interact with the bee colony. And then we would um, run over when a hornet came in and turn on the video camera and record what happened. So Heather with her army of undergraduate students who help her, thank their blessed hearts, um, would sit for hours going through these videos and timing events and figuring out how long the hornet stayed and things like that, whether they landed and all the stuff you see on the slide. And then we could actually show, like in the last column there of this graph, 
that if there was very light spotting, we are spotting on a high front in the left-hand gray column there on the left hand on the chewed entrance column, uh, Humberto, we had um, roughly 30, 25, 30 seconds they would stay chewing at the entrance. And if there was very much dung spotted on the entrance, they basically just landed, chewed a minute and left again. It really prevented them from continuing their attack. And that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very straightforward result right here with so light amount of poop. They yeah. they spend a good amount of time chewing, but when yeah. you have more poop, almost almost zero seconds. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's straightforward. And why do they chew the entrance? I oh, to try to get in. The hornets are the, they make the entrances small enough that the hornets can't fit in. Otherwise, they'd be marauded all the time. Yeah. So, um, if you left it un, unattended, they would chew their way right through the wood. There, you can hear it. You can saw it and listen to them chewing. You can watch the sawdust falling down below their mandibles on the bottom wow. board there. And so people who keep bees in Vietnam usually position one of their family members out in the apiary to chase away hornets. So sometimes it's the grandmother, sometimes it's the kid. They go out with a badminton racket. And when the hornets show up, they whack them. And that's how they prevent these attacks from happening all the time in their, in their own bee hunt. And naturally, the bees make their entrances very small for similar reasons. Smaller entrances are easier to, to guard. So, yeah. um, you know, the bees do it naturally and the beekeepers mimic that because it helps them to give the bees the best offense. And when we wanted to record a real attack, the easiest way to do it was to just give an entrance that was hard to defend. And pretty immediately, the hornets honed in on who was which colony was not easily defendable. And within you know an hour and a half, they had forced those bees to abscond because the attack had gotten so intense within about 75 minutes, wow. <laughs> which is pretty incredible. So, you know, having all this pile of videos, I'm so grateful to all of my students for the help that they've given. But the truth of the matter is, when you're looking at a new system like this, um, you really need to spend a lot of time with the videos. So I have watched a lot of these videos myself, because you, you, you really need to understand through the repetition of looking at hundreds of attack videos to feel like you have, you're, you're measuring the right things um, when you're going through them and taking data on the right behavioral metrics. So it's in, you can't just say to students, you know, go in and measure these 10 things and then we'll spit out a graph and that's what happened. You really need to spend some time. Like we did this research in 2013 and published it in 2020. Guard came to my house in 2018 before the pandemic and spent a couple days here where we were just like trying to get a handle on our, our field impressions, what the data was starting to say. I went back into the data over and over again with my students to pull out more stuff. The more we could answer some questions, it often gave rise to another set of questions. Like in particular for this one study, we probably went back into the data set four to five times. And and we've still done that again and again for subsequent publications. And my students are going through these videos still to pull out more data about how the bees are responding over time. Like each question kind of yields more questions. And um, when you're looking at the behavior of animals, you have to spend a lot of time observing and watching, which is a pleasure for me. I mean, I, I really love this stuff. I spend all day watching my dogs. I spend all day watching people. I spend all day, you know, watching bees. And I feel like of the species on the planet I know well, it's, you know, honeybees, dogs, and humans. And it's it, that comes as a behavioral ecologist from just time put into thinking about how things are responding in their environment. So it's very difficult to show up in a foreign country um, and see a system that we know a real skeleton amount of information for and just barf out a paper like this. It really took years of talking and uh, brainstorming and revisiting our field data over and over again to pull all the pieces together. And in addition to this, you know, Guard worked with local beekeepers to really survey the entire country of Vietnam to reach out to beekeepers and say, okay, this is what we're seeing in our field site, but 
could you go out and look at your hives right now? And do you see these spots in your in your yards? Do you keep Apis serrana? Do you keep Apis mellifera? And then over the time that we spent putting this data set together, both Gard and I presented it to different audiences, and each of us heard from people around Southeast Asia and beyond, like, oh yeah, we see this. Here's some images from Thailand. Here's some images from China. Here's some images from Bhutan, and we're seeing like the same oh, thing. Oh, nice. So we. The story got built over years of our work, both in the field and then afterwards, and then our interactions with people thereafter, t- telling the story and asking them about their experiences. I'll just, I'll just add a couple things here. So, um, and you probably want to get to your audience pretty quick, but I came back from Vietnam around the 1st of October of 2013. And I had submitted a talk to the Entomological Society of America about this research we were going to do, having no idea if we'd get any data whatsoever, right? And that was in November. So I had about six weeks to pull together some graphs. And I went back and looked at that presentation not that long ago. And it literally is the framework of this paper. But it was like, we saw this and here's a video and this is what we think is happening. But it took all these years after that to actually get all the information out of the videos and to uh, show that was what was happening. And I got done with the talk and I went out and oh, I'm trying to think of his name. Oh, Turul Jure from Puerto Rico was there. And he came up to me, he said, uh, do you realize what you're describing here sounds like tool use? And, and I said, tool use? He said, yeah, my students and I just completed a review of tool use and, and like the, what constitutes tool use in animals. And he said, everything you're talking about here seems like it fits. And I wrote to Heather, I'm like, Heather, let's listen to this. I, I never even thought of this, right? Mm-hmm. And then it was like, well, how do we demonstrate tool use? And that's where we had to go, they, she had, they had to go through video after video after video and look at the timing of these events like you had in that previous slide to mm-hmm. show that the dung actually had an impact on the hornet behavior. And it met all the criteria of tool use. And tool use is a real rabbit hole when you dive into the literature. I spent a good three weeks, you know, I teach animal behaviors and we talk about this, but if you really want to get into the details of how the concept of animal tool use has evolved in the seventies, essentially, um, it's gone from only humans use tools to, okay, a couple of primates use tools and it's really obvious things like rocks and sticks to people expanding out the definition of tool use uh, through really rigorous criteria and text like books on it to um, saying, you know, things like insects use tools all the time. And so it's, it's actually a pleasure to read that literature because it, to me, it's just like this expanding idea. I often talk about this in my animal behavior class. You know, people used to say only humans have culture and now it's like, no, Dolphins have culture, primates have culture. There's some really cool papers out there right now about whether or not, you know, how social learning works in bumblebees. So um, the world of what used to be only for humans is expanding all the time. And um, I really love the idea of saying, okay, well, let's take the this concept of where we can really see tools being used in a well-accepted way amongst vertebrates and apply it to honeybees. And you know, we're the first people to really argue this and we feel pretty confident that it fits that definition. It might not be the only way honeybees use tools, but it currently, you know, we're kind of pushing that idea and saying we really need to think about, we really need to think about honeybees using tools in this way. I think an excellent example is something, it was so cool because when I was reading about all this, these tool use papers and tool use amongst insects. One of the examples was these lily beetles that eat their leaf beetles or a type of leaf beetle. They eat plants and then they poop and they kind of fling that poop onto their back. So they walk around as these kind of, uh, you know, juicy looking beetle grubs that essentially are unappetizing to predators because they're wearing a po- their own poop as a shield on their back. And that's a classic example in this, in this literature of tool use. And I thought, oh, wow, that's so cool. And then the same summer, I had planted all these lilies in my backyard and they were polluted with these poop back, um, you know, leaf beetles. And while I was picking them up to try and save my lilies, I was like, cool, this is tool use. This is exactly what I've been reading about. More poop, more poop and insects in my own backyard. This is fabulous. 
Wow, that's fantastic. So going a, maybe a, a little step further than that, because uh, uh, I always think, do they have con conscience? Uh, honeybees is a social insect. Uh, I would like to, to see your thoughts on that. Do you think they can recognize us? They, they can, uh, you know, feel anxiety or what kind of, uh, I was fascinated by this kind of thinking. And yeah. when your prediction for the next Nobel Prize in animal behavior is going to be? It's going to be honeybees again? <laughs> uh, you know, when I, I was a postdoc, after I left Guelph, I went to Cornell and I worked in Tom Seeley's lab for many years before I started at Wellesley. And we used to have lab meetings. I remember one year Tom saying, can we design an experiment where we can show consciousness in honeybees? And we read, we read books together. We looked at other, I mean... This is something I talk a lot about in my classes at Wellesley. The difficulty of the whole question of animal consciousness is that even for primates, you can't get them to tell you what they're thinking. They don't yeah. communicate. I mean, even between both Umberto and Guard, I can I can assume that you're conscious because you're sort of responding to me, and I can assume that your brain is working the same way my brain. I know my brain is working, but it becomes very there's like a really big black wall that separates us from other animals. So we end up having to try and infer this through their activities, and um, it can be very difficult to do this with insects. Um, some of the papers we read in my classes, though, look at how honeybees can count, how um, tests for human emotions like pessimism when they're applied to other primates, the primates pass the same tests, and then they start applying those tests to dogs and the dogs pass, then they apply them to, you know, bees and the bees pass the same test. So either, you know, you can say humans <clears throat> experience pessimism in optimistic states and so does everything else that passes this test or we need another better test to infer this but um yeah it's a very complicated question that's difficult to answer a lot of people uh, it's you know a, a big debate because if animals have consciousness in the way that humans do it brings up a whole bunch of ethical questions and so you know it's a very sticky question that i love to wrestle with with students in my classes yeah that's that's exactly my point because I don't know if people at home know, uh, I, I'm a vegan guy and I have problems now thinking about consuming honey. <laughs> I think you're okay. Personally, I'm okay. You're okay. Yeah. I'm vegetarian and I, I, I always tell my students, I'm, I eat like the bees, you know, I'm a, a plant-based diet as well. Um, I, I, I hope you don't collect poop. Please don't say that, that you do that. <laughs> they don't eat it at least. <laughs> Not that we know of yet. <laughs> well, that's another question. How many jokes do you think you you, you got with this publication? That people, a few. A few. When I gave that first talk in 2013, I walked into another session and one of my colleagues introduced me by saying, "That's Gard Otis," and he gave the shittiest talk of the whole of the whole meeting. <laughs> and the people who had been at my talk in the morning laughed, and the other people thought he was offending me. They're offending <laughs> you. That's funny. That's funny. I'd like to hear from your. Uh, your participants here in yeah here. so let's go over guys that's that time of the questions if you have questions now is the time so let me go over here boom, boom. oh thank you guys a lot of people are saying you guys are amazing so thank you <laughs> i mean we're just having fun so i'm glad yeah, we're okay. having fun yeah, I always, I always say I got really lucky being able to do what I like to do and getting paid for it and having fun at the same time. It's like, yeah, that's deal. <laughs> that's a privilege. Yeah. Yeah. So Amy is asking, couldn't beekeepers reduce the entrance size to exclude the hornets? Yeah, they do already. But a few of the beekeepers actually put a little metal plate around the entrance so that the hornets can't chew in. And of course, that's a smart thing to do. And why they don't all do it and haven't figured it out, I don't know. But you see this a lot where some people will come up with technology and it might spread locally, but it often doesn't extend. There's very little communication, even from village to village. So that that kind of thing often doesn't, uh, the idea doesn't spread. But they can do that to some extent, yeah. It, I mean, that, is... that reduces one problem. You know, you still have the problem of the hornets outside the nest. So as a beekeeper, they're shutting down foraging. Because yeah, they do they... shut down foraging. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but... Uh... That might be a lot of work too, depending on the size of your yard. Well, 
It's probably it's, essential though. <laughs> yeah. It, it's actually easier to send grandma out with the badminton racket and whack it on it. That works really well. Oh, <laughs> You'd right. be surprised how many how many elderly people in households are wandering around with badminton rackets in the backyard with the beehives in the day. Oh, I, I want to see that now. <laughs> I'll buy a ticket. Okay, I think this is a question, but I'll take you anyway because I like it. So, Kyle, thank you very much. And thank you guys for taking the time to come here and teach you the whole world about your work. Our pleasure. All right. The Canadian beekeeper blog. Mm -hmm. Can you explain, elaborate to me how the buffalo dung is being used to defend against wasps? I don't understand that part. Well, there's some mystery to it, I think. Like definitely what we just described is that it's pretty clear that if the dung is around the entrance, the hornets are much less likely to land at the entrance and try and chew their way into the colony. So that's a that activity is a big problem for the colony the, of bees within that hive because if the hornets are able to breach that nest or get into it, it means that they can really start to force the bees to have to evacuate their home. That these Apis serrana will very quickly abscond and just give up and fly away. So the more the hornets can harass them, the more that they can threaten and actually get in, the more intimidating it is for the bees and the more likely that they'll have to leave. So some things we don't know about this dung is, and it's not just buffalo dung, you know, honestly, we don't know exactly what the bees are looking for in this, in the the animal dung that they're foraging on. We definitely saw in our dung piles that there were favorite spots to return to. And we can't say if that's because it was a specific animal and how that animal processed the food and produced dung. We don't know if they were looking for a, a specific forage that that animal had been eating and then now was excreting out. Very interestingly, we know from research in Japan that where they see Apis serrana after giant hornet attacks will collect actual plant material, bring that plant material home and start swabbing it or smearing the juices possibly around the entrances. So it could be that in Vietnam, these bees are not looking for dung necessarily, but they're looking for processed plant. plant. Yeah, yeah, processed plant from the dung. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. And so there could be, you know, plants produce things all the time that are anti-insects, you know, repellents for insects. And so that's a really good hypothesis that we don't have data for, but it's very possible that there's something in that dung that is repellent to the hornet. Now, what's interesting is it's attractive to the bees because it's a weapon for them. Um, and that's a whole nother set of questions. How are the bees, how did they overcome what should be repellents to possibly their close cousins, the hornets, and you would think maybe them too, how did they become attracted to it and still it's it's gross enough to the hornets to stop them from um, chewing on the entrances. Some other ideas that are possible is that, you know, we, we saw that video of the hornets wagging their abdomen on the high front, and we know that that's a big part of their recruitment, that they use the smell to kind of pull in their nest mates to attack a colony. And so, yeah, that's it right there. So that's the wagging. So it's possible that the dung has some ability because we, when we've looked at in another paper, we've looked at this, this dragging behavior of the hornets and they mark these colonies over and over and over again. And the more they mark it, the more hornets build up at those colonies. And a lot of the marking is very focused around the entrance. So it's possible that the dung it's sort of like a chemical camouflage to help get rid of this smell. Um, we tested that really briefly, not in any way that like, this is something that I think we could look at again if we get back into the field this fall, we're hoping to. Um, we did take some of that, the, the, the gland, we dissected out of some hornets and rubbed it in different places on high fronts to see if the bees would specifically try and cover up that smell like in those spots where we put it. And we didn't find very convincing evidence. However, the fact is, Naturally, if the human's not doing it, the hornets put that chemical around the entrance. And that also happens to be where they put the dung to. So the, the bees put the dung. So it could be important for just squashing the smell and getting, I mean, we really don't know. Um, so you're, in answer to your question, why do they do it? We know that it has the outcome of reducing the time the hornets spend around the entrance, but it could have 
other benefits as well that we haven't been able to test yet. That's a long answer, but it's it's actually a, an important question well, and one that parts of it that we have have not totally resolved and hope to through future work. No, I think, yeah, that's you, I think you can tell in there that Heather's thinking about these things because she is planning to go back this fall, hopefully, to pick up some of this research again. So these ideas are ro rolling around in the head, probably in your sleep and while you're sleep. eating all the time, um, yeah. as you're sort of solidifying your thoughts around them. Because that's what we do. You know, you're, you're thinking about things at odd times and the, the insight doesn't come when you're necessarily sitting at your computer with your pen in hand or whatever. It can come come anytime. All of a sudden you go, wow, I didn't think of that before. And then you, you know, then you have an idea. So, you, you know, what? I'll also give a lot of credit to both this paper and the one that Gard and I and our colleagues published just a couple months ago. They both have gotten a lot of media attention because people are very interested in hornets right now. And the bees are doing pretty amazing things. So a lot of science journalists and journalists that aren't even science journalists want to ask us about this work. And people have been asking us, like your your audience now, some of the questions that they're asking or the things the journalists asked us. And and so for years now that, well, not since 2020, it feels like years sometimes in the pandemic when you're sitting alone working on this data set all the time. But, you know, in the last year and a half, we've had a lot of really great questions asked of us. And it's it they have been very helpful for making me imagine next steps it's been uh it's been great to talk about it with people because it really has gotten those wheels turning for sure i, I face similar similar situations but that's why i actually I like what i'm doing right now because the interaction with people that is not from the field sometimes they bring us some questions that were just who are you you know just boom it's right there people mm -hmm. you know i think people need to be more into science everyone everyone I think when people are trying to digest a story like this, it has a lot of moving parts. Their yeah. questions are the heart of the matter very often. Like, you know, they really can nail in on the thing, like, why, why does that happen? And so yeah. it highlights when the same people are at, or different people are asking a lot of the same kinds of questions. You're like, that's the question we need to go after next. Of all the hundreds of questions that we <laughs> still have probably about the system. It's not a it was probably about four years ago, I gave a seminar in a class, an animal behavior class in, on campus. And at the end of it, the prof said to me, he said, well, that's a really inter interesting story, but you haven't proved that tool use idea yet. You've just suggested it. And that was like, okay, we got to prove the tool use idea. We didn't, we hadn't done that part of it yet. And it's like, okay, we got a lot more work to do here than you had. Yeah. And one other thing, you know, that I think that people don't, like Heather and I are just ordinary people. We aren't, we're not, we're not giants like you, like you introduced us, but we observe and we have a lot of experience observing and we have a lot of experience with honeybees. And so when we see something that's new or different, then you ask the questions, you start, you know, the questions just come flooding into your head. Like, what is it? Why are they doing it? All those kinds of things. And then um, the trick is how do you design the experiment? Because like, Heather said, the bees can't talk. So you have to design these experiments so they're clear cut that whatever the response to the experiment is gives you an answer to your question. And that's the trick of being a, a good behavioral biologist really is how you design your questions and your experiments. So the animals, bees or fish or whatever they are, crayfish, they'll give you the answer to the question you're trying to ask. And that's not easy to do, but Heather's really good at it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. would argue too about the tool use thing. Like that's a hard thing to prove because you, like we've been saying, you can't say to the bees, "Are you using this as a tool?" Yeah, no, they have to, they have to see what it does and how it influences their behavior and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The criteria for tool use are things like the 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 or the animal holds it and orients it properly. That it's something that their body didn't produce. That they're bringing to the right place to use for the a purpose that seems to alter whatever they're using the tool on in a way that improves its properties for for a potential purpose and in this case it's them going to a pile of dung picking it up bringing it back putting that dung in the right spot and it alters the properties of that hive entrance in a way that has an effect it has the effect of improving their defense against hornets so in many ways the 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 notion that we need to prove tool use to me it's just like 
that's impossible. We, they, we, they can't tell us they're using it as a tool. You can't get a two-year-old to tell you that. Maybe you can get a 20-year-old human to tell you that. And that's about the limit of where, you know, other than that, we have to come up with criteria that we can say, you know, everyone agrees on these criteria and we are arguing that the bees fit that criteria in this instance. Yeah, very challenging, but very exciting too. Yeah, but that's what it makes it controversial. So that's kind of why I, I like it because we're, we can get into these sort of philosophical debates about what can an experiment show you in, in when you're yeah. studying animal behavior. Yeah, I, I love this kind of conversation. Casey Dooley had, is, he has an idea here. He's considering ammonia maybe. From the poop? I think so. Like, like as a cleaning agent or a repellent? Or to repellent, do you guys have some thoughts on that? That could be a possibility? Well, we did have one situation where the bees were collecting human urine. Um, so that's close to ammonia, it's urea, I guess. Um, but another instance, they had blue spots on the hive that looked like they'd collected fresh paint. I think they're collecting smelly things. I don't know. Or sure. detergent or something. Like it almost looked like flakes of laundry soap or something. Yeah, but it it may not be a specific chemical. It may be several chemicals. It might be just be generally something that's smelly. We don't really know. But it's mm -hmm. possible it's ammonia. Uh, ammonia among other things, sure. Yeah. I don't think it's just ammonia. All right. And again, here we go. Do we see this done collection behavior for defense in any other types of bees that encounter heavy wasp pressure? <laughs> Matt, yeah, good question. I've heard from so many beekeepers from you know North America, Europe, who say, I'm going to go out and put poop in my bee yard and let the bees get it. And I say, oh, I'm so sorry, because what's going to happen is you're going to have a pile of poop that bees will ignore because the bees that you keep don't have this behavior. They didn't evolve around hornets. They don't. So currently, we know of this dung spotting behavior from Apis serrana. Um, Apis serrana has a huge range in Asia, and we know that in the north, at least in Japan, they appear to be doing something very similar with plant material, not dung. Um, from what the researchers up there have shown, there's um, so it and, and in both locations there is heavy wasp predation pressure. Um, Asia, there right now of all the arguments over how, how to define a hornet species, people agree that there are 22 species in the world. And what's the number guard? I think 19 of them are endemic to Asia. A couple of them have no, been- No, all of them are endemic to Asia. Yeah, sorry, but like- Two, you are, two are found in Europe and the Middle East, but the, yes. the rest are all native yes. to Asia. Sorry. But only, that- Only the two giant hornets so far elicit this kind of, some this kind of behavior or something similar to it. It's only- and they have unique behavior where um, just like honeybees will recruit their nest mates to certain high quality food resources like pollen or nectar, these giant hornets, when uh, gets to the fall and they have huge food demands, they shift a lot of their focusing from hunting grasshoppers and spiders and solitary things like that to hunting other social insects like wasps and bees, honeybees. And, uh, and I've lost my train of thought. Uh, sorry about that. The predation pressure gets really high in the fall, right. like extraordinarily high. So you, if you're in, if you're a honeybee colony in Asia, you've got lots of different species of hornets around you. Depending on where you are, you might not have all. You should probably don't have all of them, but you have a lot. And you and they're hungry. They're they need to hunt in a very high calorie, you know, bringing in a lot of energy per day kind of way. And and honeybee colonies are you know, a potentially big bounty if, and so they, they're visited a lot. So this kind of situation, even though outside of Asia, there have been introduced species and some of the species have ranges that extend that far naturally within Europe. Um, most of our, our Apis mellifera, Western or European honeybee, they just don't encounter, they haven't encountered this kind of hornet pressure historically, you know, over evolutionary time to develop these defenses. Although um, in some of the, you know, in some of the regions where they just start to overlap, like um, the Mediterranean, where you get Apis mellifera encountering uh, hornets like uh, the Oriental or Vespa orientalis in that, in that zone, those Apis mellifera have some of these tricks, not necessarily fecal spotting that we know of, but things like bee balling and grabbing, like forming um, big, 
they call them bee carpets on the front of the entrances where they can reach up and try and grab individual hornets and overwhelm them in these bee balls. So in areas where Apis mellifer does encounter historically over, you know, not just recent introductions, but over long periods of evolutionary time, they have evolved some of these tricks in, in uh, you know, it, it's just a beautiful demonstration of how that kind of predation pressure can force the prey to come up with strategies to counteract their predators in this kind of evolutionary arms race. Wow. And, and I'll add these two giant hornets are the only, I believe they're the only species of wasps that are known to recruit their nestmates to food. That's where I was trying to go before. Honeybees recruit their nestmates to pollen and nectar. And these giant hornets will, in the fall, recruit their nestmates to social insect colonies like other colonies of wasps and to honeybees. So they have this special recruitment behavior. So you end up like this photo here that you have up with five hornets on the front of this one beehive. And then the bees have evolved this suite of behaviors to defend against. And we don't see the spotting behavior. So far, we've only seen it in response to the giant hornet species we had in Vietnam. We don't see it in response to the other hornets that we did see. There were four species that we saw. Interesting. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So this is not a question, is, but I think you need to know. You're not <laughs> oh, ordinary oh. people. You're <laughs> giants. And I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we're pretty ordinary, but anyway, we're pretty regular people. <laughs> what I think is so great is that um, people who like bees or keep bees are so interested in research. I think that is an extraordinary relationship. And certainly in my department, my biology department, where lots of people study different things, you know, plants, animals, microbes, um, very few of them have the kind of interest that beekeepers uh, create around research that's being produced. I mean, this is a very unique situation, like Hive TV um, or the beekeeping talks that I, Garden and I, and a lot of researchers get asked to give all the time by beekeeper organizations. There is just such a voracious appetite amongst people who are interested in bees for more information about bee research. So it creates this feeling like maybe we are giants. That's very sweet to say, but it wouldn't have even have happened if there wasn't a, you know, a really interested audience out there. And I think that's very unique and special. That's cool. Okay. What do you think about that? So. Oh, the tool had to be modified to be considered a tool. I mean, no, it's considered the criteria, like the sort of the gold standard for criteria. Um, it was a definition proposed in the 80s and widely adopted in the literature and then just recently updated by the same author and some of his students in 2011. Like the books are called Tool Use by Animals and then the, the revised version of that. So it's, it's a pretty comprehensive catalog and it is kind of the, like I say, the gold standard that people return to, even though they argue about the details. And, and if anything, the arguments have been like, we need to expand this definition even more broadly and not just have it be uh, these four criteria, but the criteria are that the animal carries it, that they orient it properly, and that they use it for a specific purpose and it improves the properties of what they're applying it to. There's nothing like it has to be, you know, broken or bent or anything like that. Right. The, the, there's a whole bunch of, they have a whole list even of ways that tools can be used and it's things like smearing, applying, fixing. Um, and so there's a bunch of verbs that fit the, the actions that animals might use in order to use a tool. And some of them involve manipulation in terms of reshaping, but not always. Thank you. And I will even say, if I could say, in the midst of writing all of this, you know, I, I worked with Tom for many years and I asked him to look at our manuscripts, Tom Seeley. And one of the things he wrote back is he's like, I'm not sure that this is tool use. And, <laughs> and so we had a conversation over email about like, well, what would you call tool use? And he sent me some papers and I said, I know these papers and definitely that's tool use, but here's a whole bunch of other stuff that would, you know, people are arguing that this is tool use too. And it's not that obvious of, you know, that kind of old school definition. And he really liked this criteria driven way of looking at it. And in the end, he was like, you know, you convinced me. And I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. I'm going to have this back and forth. But it was cool that we had to kind of work at explaining this. So I think in many ways as humans, we have this bias 
about what constitutes a tool because we are humans and we have hands and fingers and we have a sense intuitively of you know what a human tool is but that definition is a bit broader when we think about animals at least in its current usage i see you look really closely at the photo there. sorry what's that part if you look really closely at the photo of the wasp, you'll actually see that it has an opposable thumb on the tip of its foot. If you look really closely at the opposable thumb, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 All right, okay, next in line. Oh, Dr. Katie Lee here with them in the house. Is there a favorite dung pile? Oh, there that's are dung right. dancers. Like to know that one. Well, okay, so let's go back to the, the Japanese papers. There was a set of two papers published in 2016 and 18 on this, these observations that bees, after attacks by giant hornets, were going to certain plants, chewing off pieces of the plant, bringing those plants back, and swabbing the juices around the entrances. They called it smearing. That's the verb that they used in their paper. So um, one of the papers focused on what they called emergency dances, which were essentially um waggle dances that they saw occurring often on the outside of the colonies when when um these attacks were happening and the initiation of plant smearing occurred and so there's a you could probably do a whole bunch of study follow-up studies just on this really intriguing work but like the sense is that these emergency waggle dances on the outside are recruitment for plant foraging for the smearing behavior and definitely when you go through our video set we see uh, Apis serrana outside of the hives on the high fronts doing waggle dances. Um, we have don't have enough data to connect that up to the initiation and those dance. What we would do in a classic uh, behavioral study looking at uh, waggle dancing is often you mark the dance followers and then you get a sense of well, what's their activity after they've followed this information. Where do they go? What do they come back with? How long? How quickly do they leave? When do they come back? Do they start recruiting themselves? We don't have that kind of fine grain information, but we definitely saw these outdoor waggle dances on the fronts of hives that very much sound like these emergency dances the Japanese reporter or researchers reported. So I think there's something there that needs more follow up. And and we didn't have, like you say, we didn't have marked bees, not very many. So we couldn't follow individual bees for very long and know if the same bee is doing this behavior for three days running or if it's one bee doing it, another bee doing it, another bee doing it. We just really, and we don't even have an idea how many bees are involved. But one thing that's clear is because the spots build up over time, it doesn't take a massive number of foragers collecting spots to very relatively quickly have quite a few spots on the front of a hive and they keep building up over time. So, but we have no idea. We don't know how many are doing it. And, and yeah. We have one set of videos that I've looked at a lot for a couple of the studies that we've done and it's a very strong reaction to an attack. And um, it's pretty remarkable because you can skip through the minutes of the video and it can go from having a pretty clean high front and then the first hornet show up and then within about an hour, I, I mean, I haven't counted the spots, but there are probably about 600 spots over an hour. So this isn't, you know, even if you have a single bee getting uh, a close by dung pile because they don't well, forage. Well, takes a lot of bees. Okay. It takes a lot of bees to get that fast of a reaction. But yeah, you would need to do some, you know, in honeybee behavior, we're always looking, or any kind of social insect, you're always looking at what's happening at the colony level, like the colony is getting spots. And here's how many spots there are. It takes a whole set of different kinds of studies with a different approach to get down to the worker level. You know, who are the workers that are responsible for producing that colony level effect and how are they being motivated to do it? How is their activity affecting the actions of other bees around them to get them in on? Because foraging in honeybees is such a communal uh, behavior, but we know from a lot of work done in Apis mellifera, just how important signaling is and feedback is for controlling that foraging effort. And I will say when it comes to, this is a really exciting thing about Apis serrana, that level of detail just from decades and decades of, of really cool work by many uh, people who have been focusing on those questions, it's just not as clear in Apis serrana. We can make a lot of inferences because 
in many ways they are similar, but when you meet these bees in person, which is, you know, this trip was the first time I did, and it was like meeting a wild cousin that you couldn't even have imagined existed. It was so cool to have spent, you know, so many years working with Apis mellifera and then walk up to a colony that like kind of looks like Apis mellifera. They're smaller, but they, they look a lot like them. And they just shocked me immediately with how differently they behaved. So I don't know. I just love thinking about how they could be the same versus how they're clearly different in their behavior. And a lot of it has to do with this hornet predation pressure. They're very, very fast little bees. They fly in these darting pathways that Apis mellifera doesn't do. They're very reactive to any kind of movement at their entrances, uh, human, wasp, anything. Moving cameras around, uh, they are very visually tuned into the sight of things changing at their hive entrance in a way that honeybees, they almost, our, our poor honeybees in my backyard, you know, guards backyard in North America, they just almost seem sleepy and kind of dopey in comparison. Yeah. They're so unreactive. Yeah, yeah. If you want to understand bees, you really need to go to Asia because after you've seen, like, this is just the hive bee, and then there's the dwarf honeybee. There's two species of those, and then there's, like, two or three or four species of giant honeybees. And every one you encounter is doing something different, and it forces you to rethink what you think you know about our honeybee, Apis mellifera, in a different context because you've suddenly seen all this other stuff, and you have to, like, sort through everything and put it all in place again. It's a very educational experience. Yeah, and the honeybees we work with, you know, they're – they're a product of uh, human interaction. You know, they've been working with humans for a long time and humans have been working with them to promote traits that they like. And I even said to my lab group two nights ago when we were meeting and kind of introducing a couple of new students to the system, I said, you know, the bees that we have on campus, they're like, like dogs and the Apis Rana, they're like wolves. They're like living a real life where they've had to fight to survive. It's a real David and Goliath story because these are small bees and small colonies and their worst predators are really big and mean and they attack in packs. So they've had to evolve these really remarkable defenses and the fecal spotting is just, it's kind of amazing that we can even add it to the list because the list is already incredible of some of the defenses that they have. Wow. Yeah, it's fascinating to think. I, I had the same experience when I visit Thailand and get in contact with them. And it's just, it, it's a little shock and, and you look and you don't, you know, there is things that you see in Ips mellifera that seems normal. And then you look at the other something, something's wrong. You, you can't say what it is right away, but you can see something's wrong here. I don't know what's going on, but something's wrong. Yeah. They're different. Okay. Okay. Let's see. When I first went to Asia, it was 86, 1986, and I experienced just Apis serrana and the giant honeybee, Apis dorsata, fairly briefly. But something went off in my brain, and I said, when I have my first sabbatical leave, I'm going back to Asia because I have to study these bees because they're just phenomenal. And I've been playing with them ever since. It's been, uh, they're, they're amazing bees. <laughs> yeah. So, Canadian Beekeepers blog is question. Uh, last question before I go back to work. I'm not sure I understand this question, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where I'm trying to ask for help. I don't know if I understand. Yeah, if you can't reformulate the question. Oh, I think I know what I mean. I think because Guard said that the um, the hornets shift from sort of solitary hunting of individual arthropods to attacking the hornets, do, the social, hornets. The hornets attacking social insect prey because they have this huge oh. energy demand. Um, but I, I'm guessing because it ends with a, oh, I see that maybe the hornets like to prey on social insects because they need the protein and fat that the fall bees have. Well, I mean, it's kind of different in Vietnam because but this is a subtropical area. We don't really have, well, we don't know. We don't yeah. know if they're overwintering in the same way that we would expect, you know, a Canadian bee to overwinter with this long drought of pollen in a cold environment where they have to really pack 
nutrition into their body is a, is a, one of the ways of tanking up on nutrients to get through to the spring. Um, some work that Garden and I did as part of my PhD actually um, showed that bees are probably controlling uh, brood production in response to protein availability and, and turning on this uh, over kind of overwintering bee physiology to get through these, these protein droughts from the environment. Um, we don't, I mean, personally, we don't really have the data from Vietnam to know about those dynamics, although we, we do know that the hornets have an annual cycle. And at the end of their annual cycle, they are rearing their reproductives, their, their future queens, and uh, the, the drones are males that will inseminate those queens, and, and they rear them in the hundreds. And so they just need a lot of protein to rear these really large insects in enough numbers that their genes have a good chance of making it through to the next spring and having those inseminated queens um, establish new hornet colonies. So more than anything, I mean, the most obvious question is that, or the most obvious impact is that they just need a lot of food. They need a lot of fat and protein, which is, is the truth to, to rear those reproductives in the fall. If I'm, if I'm kind of inferring what maybe this question means. Yeah, but I think, I think we are in the right path. Yeah. When they, when they manage to overwhelm a honeybee colony, they, they actually move into it and occupy it and defend it almost like their own nest, the hornet's yeah. food. Um, and they continue then to go back and forth from the bee colony that they've taken over back to their own nest for eight or 10 days. It's like a bonanza. They have so much food all of a sudden that supplies all of their needs for their colony. I think it's because they're so big and they're so able to overwhelm these other insects that uh, they're able to attack them and then, and then take them over. They, they, the Japanese researchers who focused on these guys called them apex predators in their system. They're like the top of the food chain for that yeah, puts makes it in sense. perspective makes sense. they are they, relative to other insects. They probably they need to really succeed once, insects right? are humans. Yeah. They probably need to succeed once to get the amount of food they need for a really long period of time. Yeah. Oh, Just, and I, I'll add that um, when they take over that beehive and start to uh, occupy it and take over the food, take the food from it, they become really defensive, almost as defensive, defensive as if they were at their own hornet nest. And for any beekeepers who are worried about getting these giant hornets that have shown up in Washington state, for example, if they were to take over a beehive, the last thing you want to do is just walk up to that beehive, rip the lid off and start trying to get the hornets out of the colony because you're going to be um, beset by a, a bunch of angry hornets. And it's not going to be very very nice they're really i got stung by one and it was probably the most painful anything related to an insect i've ever experienced it was really bad they have really Ooh. powerful things ouch so what do they get from the the bees they get everything honey so there is a question here from jack do hornets only eat adult bees or they only cons uh, they also consume brood pollen and honey no I mean, I think some of the frustration beekeepers feel about these hornet attacks is that the hornets don't eat the adults. I mean, when they're hunting solitarily, definitely there are accounts and we saw that an individual hornet will grab a bee, fly away, land and kind of chop the head off, chop the abdomen off and kind of consume the muscle of the thorax. But when they have these group mass attacks, they just kind of throw the bees over their shoulder and keep going, the adult defenders. And um, the, you know they're not sad. I uh, can't say that, of course. That's to the problem of consciousness. But um, it's not a problem for them when the bees abscond. What they want is that undefended resource in the honeycomb inside, which includes, you know, primarily the brood that that they're after. Um, so they take a lot of pupae out. When I, when we I watched the video at the hive that finished that that successfully attacked the hive. And you see a lot of pupae because you can see the dark eyes on the on the bee. Um, they probably take larvae too. And of course, if they need sugar to like refuel, they've got the honey there. So it's kind of, I don't think they use the pollen. I've not seen that in the videos either. I, I, like Gar says, I've seen them ripping the brood out of the cells and chewing them up in in that spot or dragging them out. Yeah. 
Okay, I think we that's it for today. I just want to take the time here one more time to thank you guys very much for your time. That was that was fantastic. And I just want to encourage you guys to keep doing what you do to bring more information like that to the to all of us. And I think it's so amazing what you guys do. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. And everything we've published so far and everything in the pipeline is all open access. So you don't have to be at a university to get access to it. You can look us up online and anything we've published is open to everyone. It has all the videos and the pictures. That's so great to hear. You can read it. <laughs> because I, I, there is a lot of articles out there that I would love to bring to the channel, but I can't because there is license, commercial license. and make my life so much complicated and I just avoid them. But you guys... That's it. That's the way I think science is supposed to be. Once the data is out, it's to everybody. Yeah, thank you for that. And I will. Yes, I will. I have I, I have a schedule here. Heather, I'm going to knock your door <laughs> later, sometimes this year, to, to, so we can talk more. There's so much that you can you do that you publish that can become fantastic videos that I've, I'm for sure going to cover them. Cool. What, what I really appreciate is your focus on not just the information, but how, how people get it. Yeah. Because I think it's really misunderstood in society. People don't really understand how people go about doing what we do. And I think people have gotten a sense, in this study at least, of what we did to get the answers to uh, the questions we were asking. And, and we were lucky in a sense, we went over there knowing nothing and we really came back with an amazing amount. And we did it all, but the, the fanciest piece of equipment we had was a, a video recorder and a, 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 you know, for, for videos film and also for audio recorders. That was, that was the most technologically advanced equipment we had in the field. Coming back, we had to use some other stuff, but uh, it, it wasn't very high tech, but it was pretty fun. Yeah, I, that's the that's the goal here because uh, what what I'm doing for a living now is to helping beekeepers to to optimize the operation. Like I, I do consulting, and I, I really feel that sometimes when people are talking to me, they they talk about their science experience at uh, in high school and college. You know, it looks like people give a science uh, uh, is separate from their life. It's not something that it did not become a tool for them to use. You know, the scientific method. That's what I want to show people here, that once you got the scientific method in your skill, you know, in your pocket, you can use it with, with everything. That could be part of your life. You can solve so many problems in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal here. I want to show how it's done, the, 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 the thinking behind, because that can be applied to many other layers of your life. Mm -hmm. It's all about asking questions and then getting answers. It's that's that's true that's correct yeah. all right thank you very thank much you. thank you very much again i think everybody is saying good things here uh you guys are the best uh, i can go on and on and yeah and i agree you guys are the best good <laughs> all right you. see you guys then uh next time right. inside the hive.tv the show about beasts see you guys <laughs> next week bye bye